Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode. Today is going to be a gigantic summer farm tour. And if you're new to the channel, my name is Stephen Cornett and I am an urban farmer who farms completely naturally. I make about 90% of my amendments, nutrients, compost, all that on site. And I achieve that using a number of methods like no-till, aerated compost and worm teas, vermicompost, Korean natural farming, and a few other techniques as well in order to create the fertility here on my farm. So welcome to my channel and I hope that I'm able to teach you guys lots of different skills including chickens, uh, trees, vegetables, and market gardening which is growing food for profit if you want to do this as a business. So this is the third year that this market garden is in production. I've got my home plot here and then I've also got a secondary plot down the road. I sell everything at the La Mesa Farmers Market and to private customers and I started farming about nine years ago and I took a couple years off in between but I've been farming full-time uh, a little over five years now. So come on, let's go check it out and I'll show you what's going on at my farm this year. So being a market garden, I focus on the crops that are high turnover and higher profit. So I do lots of salad greens, heads of lettuce, green onions, kale, chard, collard greens, microgreens, squash, cucumbers, green beans, herbs, and more. Of course, tomatoes here. If you're curious about the technique I'm using here on my tomatoes and the cucumbers, this is called lower and lean. And this is a way of growing tomatoes for a very long season. And I'm doing this outdoors. This is, a lot of times this is done inside of greenhouses though. And you can see how the tomato is stretched there. It starts in the ground right there and it's climbing all the way up to here. And we're in the middle of July right now. And these will keep going until about November, maybe December, if I can keep them healthy. So these things are absolutely loaded with tomatoes. And you can see underneath, I did a bunch of basil there. And that's called interplanting. And that's a really powerful technique for home gardeners and market gardeners. And that just allows us to get multiple crops out of the same bed. And that's how I'm able to make a decent living on a small piece of property. So here's another example of the inner planting. Underneath you can see arugula. <clears throat> I harvested that about three or four times and now it's ready to come out but I got over 20 pounds of arugula off this one little bed underneath the tomatoes. So there's lots of powerful techniques you can use like that to grow more food. In the spring and summer, I like to do some bush beans as well, just to cycle in some legumes, get some nitrogen fixing going on. It's a really popular crop uh, here in my area. A lot of people really like sweet, tasty, crunchy green beans. And here's a good example of a succession. This bed just came out yesterday, and this bed is next. I'm gonna be harvesting that this morning for a customer, and then this will be the final bed in this little small plot here. And I grow provider bush beans. Those are my favorite green beans to grow. And they're stringless as well, which makes them really easy to process. And whenever you can grow easier things to eat, I find that we eat them more often and, and the customers are more excited about them as well. So this is my next succession of zucchini and patty pan squash. If you've never seen a patty pan squash, they're really cool. So that's what patty pans look like little flying saucer, but they're really delicious and they go great on the grill just like a zucchini. So this bed's still in recovery mode. I had other squash, um, kale and chard, lettuce planted here, but that's all gone now and I've got my next succession of squash coming in. And then up here on the fence line we have blackberries and further down are boysenberries. 
I've been really happy with how the grapes and the berries have been growing on this fence line. Um, a chain link fence is actually a really great trellis. So any fence lines that you have in your yard are an excellent place to grow vining perennials like this. And here's some of my grapes. So you can see how big it's gotten. This is the third year for these grapes and I am just so impressed with how loaded they are with grapes. It's unbelievable. So I'll be harvesting those some of them today and then throughout the next uh, week or two. Got a little flower garden going here. Diversity is a really big element to my farm. I like to have as many types of plants growing in this small micro area as possible. So if they're not in my beds, then I like to have those little small flower beds going on or on my uh, neighbor's property over here, I have a lot of diversity of different things that um, not necessarily for harvesting, but they attract a lot of beneficial insects and uh, help me with the pest prey relationship going on because the more uh, attracting you can be to the good insects, so they have a home and place to set up shop and um, have their babies, those will feed on my different uh, pest insects like aphids and worms and all those sorts of things as well. I've got a lot of birds in this area which are in the mornings they constantly eat the worms off of my plants. So I actually I don't use any type of pesticide or herbicide or chemical whatsoever. I've never sprayed anything. I've never sprayed spinosad or neem oil. Nothing at all has ever been used on this property. And that's something I'm really proud of. And it's something that it's possible in a more urban area. Um, if you, maybe if you go out to the country more, you're gonna have uh, different parts of the, uh, the country, you might have a little bit more issues with insects and things like that, but you can use insect netting and there's other options. Um, there's also Jadam natural pesticides as well, which is a piece of Korean natural farming. But for me, luckily, I don't have to use any of that stuff. And I'm really proud to tell my, my customers, hey, I don't use anything on my farm. So next, let's go check out the chicken coop here. This is a big piece of my farm. This is kind of the engine to my farm and you know how this is how I make all of the compost for my farm. So on the coop here, it's taken two years, but it finally took over and I've got the passion fruit all over my coop. And it's one of my favorite fruits and they sell really well at the market and it just provides a ton of shade for the structure of my coop. And if you don't know, chickens need shade. Their big enemy is heat in the summer. So any shade that you can give them is gonna really help them. And then here are two of my favorite elements of the coop. It's the automatic feeding system I have here. I've got a video about how to build these, but I can fit uh, about 50 pounds of food in these little candy cane feeders I made. And you can see her eating. And then on the inside here, you can see the nipple system. And these are called poultry nipples. And that pipe is connected to a 50 gallon water tank here. So that's just something I have to fill up and keep checked on. But you know, every one to two months in the summer, somewhere in there is when I'm filling it up. So I don't have to do a lot of work for these chickens. I'm not coming out every day to deal with their water and feed. I'm just coming out and collecting their eggs. And these are, they're in there hanging out. <laughs> so inside of this coop, I have 20 chickens and five different breeds. Again, I like to have diversity in here. I've got barred rocks. I've got Rhode Island reds, the classic. I've got Rhode Island Whites. This one right here is a Black Jersey Giant. And then I also have a couple Blue Wyandots as well. And the Blue Wyandots are extremely docile. They're such nice chickens. I think they'd be really good for if you have kids. And you'll notice on the floor of the chicken coop, those are a bunch of bean plants. And those came from the bed that I just showed you. So all of the leftover plant material comes into here, goes on the floor, the chickens eat it, um, they mix it up into the straw and start the soil making process for me. And then later, uh, about once a month, I clean out uh, part of the coop and bring out a bunch of straw material. I mix in other crop residue that I've pulled out when I'm flipping my beds. 
and build my compost pile here. So this is one that's still cooking. So the pile's sitting a little above 130. It maxed out a week ago at about 155. Um, so now I just flipped it yesterday. So it's gonna heat back up a little bit more probably. Um, and then I'll continue to flip it about once a week. If you'd like a really detailed video on making compost, I'll put a link for you guys. Um, but I did two different videos all about how to build and maintain a hot compost pile with lots of different theory and um, techniques and formulas in there to help you figure out how to do the best backyard compost pile that you can. All right, then over here, this is a recent expansion that I've done. And this is all done in grow bags. These are 10 gallon grow bags, I believe. They're from Bootstrap Farmer, which is an excellent farm supply company. They do lots of different seedling trays and uh, things for microgreens. They do tunnels. My Actually, my greenhouse over there is made by Bootstrap Farmer as well. So in the grow bags for their soil, what I did is I, I brought in some really good compost from a local soil maker and I just amended it with uh, minerals like azomite. Um, when, I, when I planted my peppers, I put in some good fertilizer for peppers and that's it and everything's done extremely well in these. I've got a drip irrigation system as well. I've got videos on all of this stuff on my channel and I'll put links down in the description to all these videos I keep mentioning. Because um, on my channel, I show everything that I'm doing and how I'm doing it and uh, lots of detail so that you guys can um, do something similar if you'd like. I also did kale and chard, different herbs in here as well. And I'm mostly doing bell peppers. But you can also see I have some Hungarian peppers as well. Hungarian wax peppers are a really nice one. They aren't too spicy, a little bit less spicy than a jalapeno. Uh, and a nice size as well. I just I really like those ones. There's another succession of my peppers coming in. So I, with with my summer crops, except for my cucumbers and tomatoes, I'm doing succession planting, which just means that I'm doing another round, you know, a month or two later to ensure I have a, a really long harvest period. So yeah, grow bags are a really excellent way that you can get some extra space. You know, in this neighbor's yard, I, I can't put a bunch of permanent beds here. So luckily he did agree to let me to do these grow bags. Um, but maybe you're in an apartment and you're in a small area, or maybe you want to be able to move your plants uh, occasionally, then grow bags are a pretty cool option. So definitely check those out um, if you're interested in, in using them. I can definitely recommend them and I've had really good success this year growing in them. So here I have some comfrey. And if you don't know what comfrey is, you gotta check out this plant. It is just an amazing one. Um, what it does is it helps revitalize soil by adding more nutrients. It sucks up a lot of those nutrients into the leaves too. So this can be used as a chop and drop, natural mulch. You can turn it into teas, which I have a video on that of course as well. Um, an anaerobic tea where you can break down those nutrients and then water them into your garden. Um, it can be used in compost making. It also can be used for medicinal reasons as well. In Korean natural farming, I can make fermented plant juice out of this as well and collect the, uh, the hormones as well as the nutrients and microbiology on there. So I have this around for a lot of different purposes and it's something I think that should be in every gardener or farmer's uh, garden somewhere, um, uh, but out of the way because wherever you put this, it'll come back every single year. But that's also a good thing because it makes it very easy to propagate from root. But you can also collect the seeds as well as long as you get the true comfrey seed. I got my seed from Grow Organic and they sell the true comfrey which does drop seed. So now that it's summertime, I am using shade cloth. This is a 50% shade cloth. This works really well down here in San Diego. And so under here, I have on the left there is more salad mix. Here's a special bed that I did using a paper pot transplanter. And what you can see here, this is my leftover green onions. And at the first stage of this, I actually had lettuce. So lettuce, 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 three rows. And then I did the green onions down the center of them. After I harvested all the lettuce, I direct seeded some radishes, which you can see right there. So green onions are about a 60 to 70 day crop. 
uh, lettuce and radishes are about 30 days each. So the idea is that the lettuce comes out, the radishes go in. When the radishes are finished, they'll be finished up at about the same time as the green onions come out of here. So I'm getting three crops in 60 to 70 days, all by paper pot transplant and direct seeding. So that's just a cool technique that I've been experimenting with. And so far so good, it's, it's working. This is a bed of totsoi and kale, split in half. That back half is the totsoi, the front half is red Russian kale. That all goes in my salad mix. This is a bed of my lettuce mix. I've got about five or six different types of lettuces in here so that my customers get a real diverse amount of texture and nutrients and flavor. Uh, my tomatoes this year, I've got black cherries. These are sun golds. Sweet 100s. And then this last row is kind of a combination of different things. The ones you're seeing right here that have this really nice look, these are called edocs. And these are ones that you're able to harvest the whole vine and let uh, ripen off vine. So you might also have noticed I have a couple of trees in this market garden as well. And this isn't a super ideal thing to do for a market garden. I wouldn't recommend it, but I did it just as an experiment. And I also wanted to give my landlords some trees after I left. So right next to me here, this is an Anna apple. This is a really famous apple here in San Diego because it's so low chill. I think it's about 150 to 200 chill hours. That's all that's required. And it'll actually fruit a couple times a year, which is pretty fantastic. And this tree has received a lot of different uh, nutrients in, that I've made. So compost, biochar, Korean natural farming, and aerated tea sprays. And it's just doing fantastic in its third year here. So I'm a big fan of trees. I love pruning trees. It's such a fun thing to do. Making the shape of the tree and making sure it's gonna have the best, most fruitful life possible. So I've got a video about pruning this apple tree if you'd like to see it. So it's been an interesting experiment doing it right next to a bed right here. But whether it's salad mix or these uh, cucumbers or anything I've done here, it's, it's worked out really well. I just, you know, it's a little bit more, I have to be a little bit more careful working around it, but we also put in a Eureka lemon here. And my landlords really wanted this because we live in a small city called Lemon Grove. So they had to have a lemon tree, right? But this thing's doing well. I harvested a few lemons off of it uh, last week, actually. And then here we have a, I think it's a Valencia orange. So we got some more oranges coming on here. And then down the row here, you can see dragon fruit, which is a really amazing tropical fruit. And all the way down at the other end, is more passion fruit and I've got this is a uh, passion fruit that I propagated from my mother plant over on the chicken coop and the idea for this is that it's gonna crawl all the way down this fence line and I have another passion fruit there and they're gonna meet in the middle and what this is gonna do is give more home for insects give me more fruit that I can sell and a little bit more of a windbreak here on this fence line so I'm really excited, you know, by next year, this will be completely filled in with passion fruit. And they've already got some passion fruits on the vine as well, which I'm really excited about. So they're doing very well here. So here's one more example of interplanting that I've done. And this is again using the paper pot transplanter, but this one I did by hand. And I just dug a little trench, put the green onions in there, covered them up. And now I've got green onions growing underneath my cucumbers. So it's another really powerful tool. You don't really need, you don't have to get the machine to use paper pots. And I think there's a lot more creative ways that we can use them going forward in the future. Uh, we seem to keep experimenting with them. And down here, you might've noticed I got a drip system. Um, and you can check this out on a, a multiple different videos. I show how I built my drip system and how I built this special manifold and, and all of those different things. But basically how this works, I have an on off for every bed so that I can control the water really easily. Um, you know, I've got 18 beds in this small property here and on a larger scale, you know, making these manifolds might not be the best choice, but on a small scale, having 
ultimate control over the water is really nice and something I've really benefited from. Um, so if you're on a smaller scale, doing something like this might be really good for you. So here's a little bit newer design of the manifold. So you just take off this one little twist off and I can take off this entire four line drip tape section here really easily all by myself. When I'm done replanting the bed, I just connect this one connection, twist it on, um, and I can lay it out all by myself really straight easily. Um, and then I'm back to, to putting water on the plants. So definitely check out that video. All the videos I've been mentioning will be in the description um, in case you wanna learn more about how I'm doing things. And for watering, I'm also using an overhead sprinkler as well. This is really convenient and helpful when you're trying to keep direct seeded beds wet so that they'll germinate well. It also helps in the summer for cooling off your crops. Um, so when it gets up to higher temperatures like 80, 85, 90 and higher, if you spray some water onto your lettuce or your salad mixes and things, um, it will help them from bolting or going bitter because there's an effect called the evaporated cooling effect, which uh, when the water is on the leaves, the wind goes against the water and then evaporation happens, uh, which cools down the plant. So kind of like a swamp cooler. Um, but that's a great technique that I've learned from people like um, Eric uh, Schultz out at Sedfest Farm and Rose Creek Farm, Ray Tyler. All right, everybody, that is gonna be it for this episode of Nature's Always Right. I hope you enjoyed the tour. It was really fun getting to show you guys around and kind of reminisce on the different things that I've done here and just really seeing how far it's come in three years, going from just an empty lot with nothing in it uh, to something that's a really productive food system. And it is possible, you can do all of this naturally. My soil is so rich and beautiful now uh, because of doing no-till, because of all the natural inputs like compost and the, and the teas and, and all the different natural methods that I'm using. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please subscribe to my channel, hit